Praise be Jesus Christ. Welcome back to our final Bible study for the, uh, for the Gospel of St. John, and we'll begin with chapter 20, go on to chapter 21. So let's begin with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, O Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant that in the same Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. St. John the Apostle, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, we're going to conclude with St. John's Gospel tonight, so we are going to cover two chapters. Uh, a lot of material to cover, so we'll see uh, how much uh, we can get through. I think we can finish it, but uh, we'll have to pro progress along pretty quickly. So Let's begin then, and as we saw in every chapter, there are those major themes. Let's take a look at what those are for this chapter. So in chapter 20, we have those seven basic themes that we've been seeing show up here and there throughout the gospel. And the one theme that shows up here is the theme of seeing God, and um, then also there is the, the issue of uh, life, and then there is, uh, we see a, one of the minor themes, um, a new creation. So uh, these these themes we uh, we just basically see uh, just a couple of basic ones here and um, as I said in the minor themes there's just the one of the uh, the new creation. Now uh, in this gospel as we begin it we're going to see uh, a couple of the uh, the issues we're going to see the um, the the first day of the week, we're going to see this theme of coming to God by seeing. That's going to show up here. In fact, that shows up in a multiplicity of places here. Uh, in fact, in this entire uh, chapter, in this entire chapter uh, 20, we see the word seeing, and going to God through seeing. We see that show up about 15 some odd times. It's it's pretty, uh, pretty noteworthy. Um, then we also see uh, in this this uh, chapter, we're going to see uh, Saint Mary Magdalene and how she is revealed to um, uh, how our Lord reveals Himself to her, and then we see uh, Saint Peter, Saint John. They come, they run to the sepulcher. We know the story. Uh, our uh, our Lord arises in the beginning part of the day, and then uh, the first day of the week. St. Mary Magdalene goes there early, and uh, she doesn't see our blessed Lord. And so she runs back, gets St. Peter and St. John. They come running back to the sepulcher, and then uh, in, once they come back, uh, then they see uh, the, the Lord is risen. They see the empty tomb, the, uh, the linens there, uh, and so uh, we have... The, uh, the resurrection of our blessed Lord. It, it's quite interesting that in the uh, in this uh, gospel here we have the, the it starts with the first day of the week. So on the first day of the week, in the gospels, this idea of the first day of the week that's what we would refer to as Sunday. In fact, we can see uh, based upon this first day of the week, we see how it's used in the Acts of the Apostles. We see that that's the day on which they gathered for prayer. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we see that they gathered for prayer on the first day of the week. 
They broke bread on the first day of the week. Paul discoursed with them on the first day of the week. And so this first day of the week is Sunday. So although we don't see in sacred scripture an explicit changing of the day of worship from the, of the change of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, we do see evidence that they were practicing this in the early Christian church. Uh, we also see this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4, where it speaks of a new day of rest for the people of God. So in the New Covenant, there is a new day of rest. And this is the, the, this new day. We see it's the, the morrow after the Sabbath. So we see from Leviticus uh, 23, we see it was foreshadowed in that. And so uh, this is the day on which uh, St. Mary Magdalene discovers our blessed Lord arisen. And so it's, it's indeed this, this uh, first day of the week uh, on which um, she comes to the tomb. So let's see what we have written here. Uh, it says, when it was dark, she came into the sepulcher, and she saw the stone taken away from the sepulcher. So that's the first time we see the word seeing. We actually see this 15 times in this chapter. Uh, then, just to give an example, uh, we see that uh, she saw the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then, uh, later, when St. John arrives, he stooped down and he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. And then when St. Peter arrives, he saw the linen cloths. And then it says that the other disciple, that is John, uh, he saw and believed. Then we see that St. Mary Magdalene once again looked down. She saw again, looked into the sepulcher. And then she saw two angels in white. And then when uh, she came out of the tomb, they asked her, why are you weeping? She turned back and she saw Jesus standing there, but she thought it was a gardener. And then uh, when our Lord uh, reveals himself to her, um, she runs back and tells the apostles, I have seen the Lord. And then when our Lord appears to them, it says the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Then we also see in verse 25 that the other disciples said to Thomas, We have seen the Lord. And then uh, he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails, I will not believe. Right? And then when our Lord comes to St. Thomas and the other apostles, he says, Thomas, put thy finger hither and see my hands. It's quite interesting that our Lord uses this, uh, this term of uh, you know, seeing uh, his hands but by contact, right? So by seeing, he's making contact with the Lord. Um, and that's uh, what is uh, taking place then. Okay, so this seeing is almost a way of, of, uh, of making contact with, with God. And then we see this chapter concludes in this way where it says uh, these words, where it says, many other signs Jesus did in the sight of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe. So we know we said that there's this theme of uh, believing through seeing, okay, but seeing through the eyes of faith, that's really the important theme. Well, that's in, in fact what we have in this, uh, this gospel. All right, so let's, uh, let's Let's set the scene once again. And by the way, the scene where I'm at, we're at here at Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is behind me, and we have a number of the landmarks visible here. So over my left shoulder here, we have the Church of the Holy Sepulchre with the gray dome that you see right there. Okay, So that's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre with the gray, the gray dome. Okay, There's a couple of gray domes. Those are both. They're all part of that uh, complex of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And then just right over here behind me, you have the Dome of the Rock. That was the location of the temple before it was destroyed. But that is the Temple Mount up there, right there. And then further off up here, you see this hill, this mountain back here. So that hill, that mountain there, that is Mount Olivet. And so it's from up there that our Lord ascended. And then if you look closely uh, down at the base of Mount Olivet, so coming down from the top at the base, you see there is this monastery. And then off over here, just barely visible here, you'll see uh, Gethsemane. 
So this is where our Lord was when he was apprehended and then was taken uh, to be crucified. Let's consider the scene that St. Mary Magdalene would have uh, perhaps seen. Okay, so there's a, a, let's take a look at a rendition here of what this would look like. So here is the temple, here is the city, here's the outer wall of the city. Um, get the laser pointer going on here. So, and then here is the, uh, the gate of the city. It came out of the city. Here is Golgotha. This is the gate from which our Lord came out. Golgotha. Another uh, rendering of it. And this is actually a rendering of the excavation. So now we have the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Remember those double domes that I showed you? The large gray dome. Um, in fact, let's take a look at that once again. So remember that large gray dome? So that's uh, this large gray dome here. And then you see the smaller one there, that smaller one I'm pointing to. Uh, that is this view. Let's take a look back. There you see the two double domes, the larger one and the smaller one. And these all encompass the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So there is another, it's not visible in that in the image behind me, but there's another little dome that is over Golgotha. So that's, of course, where our Lord was crucified, where the cross was. And then you see this brown. This shows the, the part of the uh, hill that was excavated. So all this brown was all cut away, and they left the cave. There right, is the sepulcher. They left this rock on Golgotha, so this, this dark part here they left. But everything else they just chiseled away, chopped it away, so that they could put this great basilica. I mean, this happened in maybe the 4th century. I can't remember when exactly they began the first, 4th uh, yeah, century, they began the, the first construction. Let's take a look at an, uh, yet another view of it. And so here is the footprint. There is Golgotha. You can kind of see sort of the cutaway. Uh, the city is over in this direction, Golgotha, and there is the tomb with all the hill cut away uh, for the construction of the basilica. And then, of course, that basilica was laid on that footprint. And again, here you have the crucifixion altar. So that is right here. And then you have the tomb here. The sepulcher is right here. So it's under one large complex and then over here was the stone quarry and the place where the, uh, the, the cross was found down in here in this area. Okay. Then finally, this sepulcher here, let's kind of zero in on that. This is obviously not what St. Mary Magdalene would have seen, but this is what it looks like now. So this, the sepulcher is enclosed in this small marble church a little chapel just that is, encloses the tomb. So the tomb is entered from this side behind this large candlestick. Is, you can see the opening just barely behind the candlestick. You enter from here. There's an antechamber, and then in here is where the tomb itself is, the sepulcher. So a little antechamber, and then the, the sepulcher itself back here. Looking inside at the entrance of that, of this church here, this little uh, chapel. Uh, that's the entrance. So this is the antechamber here. You have a uh, sort of capsule that encloses a piece of the stone that was rolled away. And then back in here you see this other entrance. And inside there is the tomb. But it's all covered in marble now. It's, I mean, they, they, the, the, the stone is actually still there. And in fact, if you're, as you're crossing in, a little tip for anyone who may be going to the Holy Land at some point, as you're crossing in between the antechamber to the uh, sepulcher itself, if you look up, right as you're crossing this little threshold, if you look up, you can still see the stone itself, and you can reach up and touch the stone because it's not covered by the marble right in between these two uh, openings. Of course, that's not what St. Mary Magdalene would have been seeing. She would have been seeing something more like this. Golgotha, Calvary, the stone quarry in this area where they would take stones to build the temple. Uh, 
then you have the tomb itself over here and this is all this was the rock that was cut away uh, to build the basilica but there you can see it's about 140 feet it's not that far away remember as it says in the gospel that uh, not far from the place where our Lord was crucified, there was a garden, and this is where the garden was. It doesn't quite show the garden aspect of it, so I'm just more focusing in on the stone. But there we have it. Okay. And as I mentioned, all those things are under uh, this uh, edifice over here with the, with the domes, uh, the gray domes. Um, interestingly enough, uh, if you, you notice the shape of the dome, the large dome here, okay, that large uh, gray dome, okay. Uh, that dome has a certain shape that the Muslims copied on their dome of the rock. If you notice the, the, the uh, oh, now I'm covering it, okay, there it is. <laughs> the gold dome of the rock in the, in the distance there. They tried to copy that same shape as the, this gray dome that's up here because it's almost like this, they're setting it up as an antithesis, antithesis to our blessed Lord's place of his uh, resurrection. So at any rate, uh, thanks be to God, we, we, have, uh, we have preserved that, that site. Okay, so as I mentioned, there was the first day of the week. Um, Let's, uh, let's take a look at where St. Mary Magdalene would have run from and to, right? So she went to the temple. Remember the, the layout of the city here. Uh, here is, I say the layout of the temple, the layout of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Here's the Church of the Holy Sepul Sepulcher. Uh, this is the wall as it was, I'm sorry, this wall right here, as it was in the time of um, uh, Herod. So in the time of our Lord, the wall came right here. Okay, these uh, this wall got built later after our Lord's uh, ascension. That's a later wall, but this is this was the wall at the time of our Lord right here. Okay, and so the place of crucifixion was just outside the city, and um, then the upper room where she ran to. Because, of course, she discovered our Lord. She discovered the empty tomb. She ran to the, the place of the, the sepulcher. So you see right here it says Chinaculum. That's, the, that's down here. That's, the, uh, that's on Mount Sion. As you can see, it says Sion right there. Okay, Mount Sion. That's where the upper room was. So she ran through the city like a mad woman, just you know, excited because she discovered our Lord. She ran from there and then back with them they ran back and then came out here to view our lord's resurrection now it's kind of interesting the whole the whole interplay that goes on there uh, so she runs back there's this whole uh, connection between something that takes place in genesis chapter 29 so in genesis chapter 29 we have the moment that jacob uh, meets his wife Rachel and so we have um, recall that he shows up at the uh, this well so the well is a hole in the ground and that that well was covered with a very great stone now if you remember there there's that language of the stone being very great that covered the tomb of our Lord so uh, it says in uh, Genesis 29, verse 2, there was a well in the field from which the sheep were watered, <laughs> were fed. And it says that it was closed with a great stone. And then it says the custom was that they would gather the sheep, and then once the, all the sheep were gathered, they would roll away the stone. If you remember in Mark chapter 16, verse 3, they asked the question, who will roll away the stone for us? For it was very great. Well, here in Genesis 29, verse 2, we have a very great stone. The custom is that once everyone was gathered, they would have enough people to roll away the stone uh, to feed all the flocks. All the shepherds would gather their sheep at the same time. Well, then um, uh, Rachel uh, shows up, and uh, you know he sees her. He's captivated by her beauty, and you know he 
he removes the stone. So Jacob removes the stone, waters the flock. It says he lifted up his voice, he wept, right, because he realized this was his uh, separated family, as it were. And then she, realizing that this was their separated uh, cousin, she ran in haste to go and fetch her father. And then he comes running back to the place where the stone was, right, where the well was. He comes running back. Uh, he ran forth to meet him and then, um, you know, received him into, the, into the, his house. So there's just a number of similarities here. Uh, but I would say that this Genesis 29 incident is sort of pointing forward to our blessed Lord because the place where our Lord was buried was covered with a very great stone. There was another woman who wept when uh, you know she couldn't find our Lord. She goes running back, Mary Magdalene goes running back to fetch not her natural father, but to fetch her spiritual father, that is the first pope, Peter, he comes running back uh, to, uh, to the place where um, this opening in the ground was, you know, to see. Um, and so uh, remember, though, that this was the place that where the, from which the sheep were watered in Genesis 29. And I think also in John chapter 20, the tomb is the place, you might say, from which the sheep the flock of our Lord are watered. That's where it all. That's where the, the resurrection began, and that's where the uh, uh, you know life came uh, from. Uh, resurrected life came uh, forth to us. So it's just an interesting uh, comparison, just an interesting similarity that you see between these uh, these different things. Okay. So okay, let's let's go into. Uh, the, the, this chapter in, in um, some more detail. So uh, let's take a look at the, uh, you know, the meeting uh, with uh, Peter, Simon Peter and John. It says the other disciple. He leaves his name out of it, but it's John. So uh, we see that between a foot race uh, between uh, John and Peter, we see that John would win because in fact he did win. He ran, outran St. Peter got to the tomb first, but out of deference to him, he didn't enter first, and he let Peter enter first. And then John entered after him. And they saw the linen cloths laying there, so the, there was a, the cloth that covered our blessed Lord head to foot, like the Shroud of Turin, you know, it's that Shroud of Turin cloth, covered him from head to foot, and then they had a separate cloth uh, tied over the face of our Lord. The napkin that had been about the head, not lying with the linen cloth, but apart, wrapped up into one place. So this one that had wrapped over the head, they think, was the, this, um, this uh, shroud of Turin. And so then he, uh, it says he saw, the, the, for the other disciple went in, he saw it and believed. And yet they still, it says, for as yet they knew not the scripture, there's still something that they were missing. Um, so even when they saw this, they, they, didn't, they didn't quite get it yet until they saw our blessed Lord. Now, it's interesting that our, um, our Lord rises from the dead. He's there, St. Mary Magdalene and uh, St. Peter, St. John have all seen the empty tomb, but as yet, they haven't seen our Lord. So St. Peter and St. John go back, but St. Mary Magdalene's love for our Lord is so great that she remains there weeping. She's... She hasn't seen our Lord, she hasn't found Him, so she looks again, you know, and even though it's, it's like when someone ha really has an ardor to see something, to find something that they really want, they keep looking, sometimes even in the same spots that they know they've always looked, they've already looked. Well, she does this, she looks again, and her ardor, her, her uh, yearning to see our blessed Lord is rewarded in that she sees two angels this time. So she sees two, two angels, and one at the head, uh, one at the, feet, at the feet, sitting. Now, it's interesting that they are sitting. It's almost like, because of their posture, they're showing that their work is done, as it were. In the Old Testament, I don't know that there's really ever a time that you see an angel sitting. They're standing, they're in action. At one point in the book of Maccabees, they're defending the temple in battle. But you don't see the angels sitting. But here, you have a particular thing that is pointed out that the angels are sitting down. It's like they are, they are at rest now. The work is done. The work of the resurrection, the work of the, re the redemption is done. You also see this in another gospel where when the 
uh, the, there was a great earthquake, and the, um, the account of the, the women who arrived there, it says that the angel came and sat on the stone uh, that was rolled away. Um, so the, their angels are basically showing that the, the work of uh, the resurrection is done. And then uh, she sees Jesus, and she does, does not know who it is, and she thinks it is the gardener. So again, there's more going on than just the gardener, the fact that this was a garden. This is pointing back to the Garden of Eden. And here's where we have some subtle new creation imagery, because there is a garden. There, uh, there's the assumption that this is a gardener. And the gardener, of course, the original gardener was Adam. And so our Lord is the new Adam, as 1 Corinthians 15 says our Lord is. And so she mistakes him for uh, the gardener. Now, it's rather curious that there is a certain change in our Lord in a certain way that his disciples have a little bit of difficulty recognizing him. Um, remember, so she sees him and she says, Sir, where have you laid him? I mean, you know, this is our Lord. And yet some, in some way, her, her gaze is hidden in that she doesn't recognize our blessed Lord. And yet it is, it is he. And then once, once he says her name, he sees her again, and then she looks and sees him again and recognizes that it is, it is Christ. So at first, though, there's this hesitation. We also see this with the, uh, the apostles. Um, we're going to see this in chapter 21. We'll get to that uh, later. But um, our Lord uh, says her name, and that's when she says Rabboni, which is Master. And then he says, do not touch me, noli me tangere. So he says to her, don't touch, don't. there's actually a famous work of art, so it's noli me tangere, which is do not touch me, uh, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But it's interesting that he says to her, do not touch me, but yet he says to Thomas, touch me. Well, Thomas, as you may know, is a priest at this point. Um, so is there something going on there? It's not clear, but... Um, regarding that, you know, Thomas has, he is invited to touch our blessed Lord, so you can see that this is indeed our Lord, but yet Mary Magdalene is told not to, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Now, the reason why, you know, the ascension was done so that we would uh, not be seeking our blessed Lord in a, too much of a, in a tangible way. Uh, we would not be seeking our blessed Lord in his body here on earth because otherwise we would not want to go to him in spirit, we would not want to go to him in prayer, not want to have an internal relationship with our Lord, as it were, if we believed, well, he's just there in Jerusalem, we, and if we want to go talk to him, we would have to go to Jerusalem to do so. So she, she has, you might say, uh, maybe too much of an uh, attachment, perhaps, to, his, uh, to him in the flesh, and so he says, do not touch me, I have not yet ascended to the Father. He ascended to the Father so that he could send the Spirit, and it was through the Spirit that uh, we come to a knowledge of Christ. And notice he, he mentions, uh, he says, I ascend to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Now why does he use this language, my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God? Well, he's making a distinction between himself as a divine person and the others as uh, human persons, right? Um, and he says, go to my brethren, this is verse 17, by the way, go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. So, one, it shows my Father and your Father. There's a distinction in how we call God Father versus how Christ calls him Father. Our Lord is of the same substance as the Father, so he, he uses that singular, my Father. And then he makes a distinction between that and your Father, in that we have adopted sonship. So he doesn't just say, our Father, you know, that I ascend to our Father in heaven. No, he says, I, my Father and your Father. There's, there's a distinction in the way that God is Father to Jesus and how God is Father to us. So he's making that distinction. But then why does he say, my father and your father, and my God and your God? Well, because he is also showing his two natures. 
my Father. That's showing his divine nature because to be a son of the Father means you have the same nature. So he's saying that in a subtle way. And then my God, he's also saying that he has a human nature. He's taken on a human nature, and so it is his God as well. His, uh, his body was created uh, by God. Uh, although his nature, uh, he had a human nature, that nature, that human nature was created as well. But the divine nature, which he always had, and his divine personhood, he always had, and that was eternal. So he's, po he's pointing out his two natures by saying, my father and your father, and to my God and your God, pointing out his human nature and his divine nature. So now we move on to the upper room. And so in the upper room, uh, we recall uh, what happens there. So here our blessed Lord uh, appears to them. It says, now it was late that same day, the first of the week. Again, the first day of the week. There's that code word for Sunday. The doors were shut, the disciples gathered, our Lord appears to them, and he says, Peace be to you. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands, his side, and uh, his disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Just imagine, that's a bit of an understatement. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. The last time they knew of him, he was hanging on the cross, and now there's this rumor that he's risen. They were overjoyed. They were overjoyed when, uh, when they saw the blessed Lord. Now here is that very famous passage which, and if you want to put this to memory, it's an important one that has to do with the, uh, the sacrament of um, penance. So it's John 20, verse 19 through 23. So in John 20, verse 19 through 23, and if you have difficulty remembering it, just remember John 20, 20. That, that's close enough, it'll get you to the, where you need to. And this is an apologetics moment, so I'm gonna bust out my apologetics hat. So, um, this is a passage which speaks of the sacrament of penance, because here he breathes upon them. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Who receive the Holy Ghost, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you hold bound, they are held bound. He's giving them, by doing so, the power to absolve from sins and to hold people bound to sin. That's key as well. It doesn't just mean that, oh, if you forgive someone, they're forgiven, but if they hold them bound, they're still held bound to that sin. You know, that's what he says. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. And whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. So they are given this power of, the delegated power, of forgiving sins. This is not a surprise to the Jews that men would be entrusted with the power to declare one free from sin or not. Because in the Old Testament, it's throughout there. In Leviticus chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, and 7, you see evidence of how the priests were the ones to declare whether someone was free from sin or not. It's, it's, it's not a surprise uh, to, to the uh, Jews. In fact, our Lord laid the groundwork for this in uh, Matthew chapter 9. So in Matthew chapter uh, 9, uh, verse 1 through 8, this is where he uh, heals the paralytic. If you recall, the man uh, is paralyzed. They can't get him into the house because there's so many people. They open the, they take off the roof tiles, start tearing apart the guy's house. They can lower the paralytic man in front of our Lord. Our Lord says, how great is your faith to the men who are doing this. And he turns to the paralytic and he says, your sins are forgiven. Now, Perhaps the paralytic was expecting a little more than that. He was expecting the healing. Um, and so the Jews say within themselves, within themselves, in their thoughts, how can this man forgive sins? No one can sin, forgive sin but God alone. And that's true. But God can also delegate that power to others, which he does. He does this in Leviticus. He does this in uh, John 20, verse 19 through 23. And then he says, but our Lord, seeing their thoughts, he says, why do you allow such thoughts arise in your hearts? Then turning to the paralytic man, he says, but you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He says to the paralytic man, you know, arise, take up your bed and walk. And the man is indeed healed right away. And notice, we, we have a key verse in Matthew 9, verse 8, where... Uh, we see the impression that the multitude who witnessed the miracle were left with. Notice the impression 
that the witnesses of the miracle were left with. The multitude, seeing it, feared and glorified God that gave such power to men. It's in the plural, and it's saying, wow, they're glorifying God that He had given such power to men. Now, our Lord had already demonstrated that He could read thoughts, because just a few verses before, He did read their thoughts. He could have turned to them and say, say to them, no, don't get the false impression that I'm giving this power to men, but that I'm God, I'm the one who forgives sins, and don't think that I'm going to give this power to men. But no, He doesn't correct that. Even though He could, He, he could read their thoughts, but yet he, he just leaves that impression and that's the impression that the people who witnessed the miracle were left with, that God had given this power to men. And what power was it? Not just to heal, because our Lord says why He healed. He says that you may know that the Son of God has power on earth to forgive sins. That's why He healed the man. That's the point of the miracle in our Lord's eyes, is to demonstrate the power that He has to forgive sins. And the people were left with the impression that He had Given, you know, been, that this power had been given to men. But not only that, we see evidence of this power being exercised in the early Christian church. So let me ask you a question. Let's see how well... Now I get to ask the question. So let's see uh, how well you know your sacred scripture. Was St. Paul in that upper room when our Lord appeared to them in John 20, verse 19 through 23? Was St. Paul in that upper room? Well... No, he wasn't. He was not in the upper room. He was not a Christian at that point. In fact, he was anti-Christian. Yet, we see in 2 Corinthians 5 that he's speaking about having been given a ministry of reconciliation. Because this is God not imputing to people their sins. This is how the early Christian church uh, operated. This is in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. And he says that God has reconciled us to himself by Christ and has given to us a ministry of reconciliation. Uh, God was indeed in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing to them their sins. He's definitely talking about reconciling people from sin. And he has placed in us the word of reconciliation. For Christ, therefore, we are ambassadors. Now, before you think, oh, well, he's just saying this about Christians in general. He's not. Look what he says in the very next verse. Christ is, therefore, for Christ we are ambassadors. God, as it were, exhorting by us. For Christ, we beseech you, Christian Corinthians, to be reconciled to God. St. Paul is making the distinction between the ministers of reconciliation, the ones to whom has been given a ministry of reconciliation, and the ones to whom they give this reconciliation. And in this case, it's the Christian church at Corinth. This isn't his first letter to Corinth. It's his second letter to the Christian church at Corinth. So he's making a distinction between the ministers of the reconciliation and those that need the reconciliation. So he's, he's talking about the forgiveness of sins of the already Christian church. It's his second letter to the Corinthians. They've been Christian for a while. And I'm not saying the ministers don't need reconciliation. Of course they do. They need forgiveness just as well. In fact, their sins hurt God all the more uh, because they're supposed to be uh, close to our blessed Lord. But at any rate, it's very interesting, very telling that St. Paul is speaking about having received a ministry of reconciliation, and yet he was not in that upper room when our Lord gave this ministry of reconciling people from their sins to the apostles. Well, it's evidence then that this ministry was passed on and was being exercised by the early Christian church. Um, we also see in James 5.16 where the, the, the prayer of a faithful man availeth much. And he says, in fact, if there's anyone sick among you, let him call in the priests. Let them pray over him. Not just anyone praying over him. Sometimes you hear about people just like, well, let me pray over you and they extend hands. Prayer is good. We've got to pray for people, right? That's for sure. So don't get me wrong. We do need to pray, but, pray for people, but uh, it's different than calling in, as he says, the priests of the church, uh, beginning in chap James chapter 5, 14. If there's anyone sick among you, bring, him, bring in the priests of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So this is the sacrament of extreme unction here, or you might know it as the anointing of the sick. 
and the prayer of faith shall save the sick man. Confess therefore your sins to one another, chapter uh, 5, 16, James 5, 16, and pray for one another that you may be saved, for the continual prayer of a just man availeth much. So uh, there's evidence, therefore, of this confession of sins. Confession, confess your sins to one another. That's what the early Christian church did. You hear about people, no, don't confess your sins to priests. But it says there, that's what they did. Confess your sins to one another. And in the context, he says, call in the priests of the church. And then confess your sins. And in fact, the last word that we have on forgiveness in the Bible is in 1 John 1.9. First letter of John, chapter 1, verse 9, we see that the last word on forgiveness is the last time the word forgive even appears in the Bible. It's right there. He says, God is faithful to forgive if we confess our sins. And we can see in the context of the early Christian church, James 5, 14 through 16, that they were confessing their sins to the priests that were called in whenever someone was sick and needed it. So, um, I, I think we, uh, we, we do a disservice when we uh, downplay or denigrate the uh, Catholic Church's practice of confessing our sins uh, to God through the priest, uh, which is certainly there in sacred scripture. We also see Job chapter 42, verse 8 through 10, where we see that uh, people who had face-to-face -face contact with God, uh, the three friends of Job, are told by God directly to go to Job and have Job pray for him and his face I will accept and that God forgave the sins of these three guys when Job prayed for them. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's a pattern that we see uh, throughout, um, throughout sacred scripture. I want to focus also in on verse uh, 22. So when, when he says to the apostles, you know, as the Father has sent me, I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them. So in John 20, verse 22, he breathes on them and he says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost as he breathes on them. In Isaiah 57, verse 16, uh, we, we have the, the precursor to this. Isaiah 57, uh, 16. It says, The Spirit shall go forth from my face, and breathings I will make. I think I mentioned this in another Bible study. The Spirit shall go forth from my face, and breathings I will make. And here our Lord breathed upon them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. And who is the one who's doing this? In Isaiah 57, verse 15, it says, The High and the Eminent One that inhabiteth eternity. That's God. So it's showing that our Lord Jesus is indeed God. He is the one who breathes forth the Spirit from His very face. And this is where it was fulfilled. That prophecy in Isaiah 57, verse 16, was fulfilled right here in John chapter 20, verse 22. So uh, now we, we get to Thomas in verse 24. And, and you know, poor Thomas always gets a bad rap. They talk about the doubting Thomas and... He really kind of gets raked over the coals a bit. But if you remember, he, he was the one who said, let us go to Judea that we may die with the Lord. Um, and there is, uh, there's evidence that uh, Thomas took the gospel to the furthest ends of the earth. So even though St. Thomas gets a bad rap regarding his doubt, uh, nonetheless, he did take the gospel to far places. Um, there is an article, I remember seeing it in the American Ecclesiastical Review, you can still find some of those archived somewhere online at seminary. We had the hard copies of them, which is great to have. And there's an article in there about St. Thomas bringing the gospel to South America. There are any number of places in South America where they have evidence of the, the sign of the cross. They have evidence of a man bringing the gospel to them whom they called, um, the, the man whom they called the twin. The name Thomas, Didymus, means twin, and so uh, the gospel was preached to them, it seems. Uh, there's a number of, uh, I'm not doing it justice just by mentioning these few details, but there is an article in the American Ecclesiastical Review, uh, that's from the, um, the early part of the 20th century, where um, 
where it's, it gives some of the evidence of this. But at any rate, let's, let's set that aside. So then uh, notice how, again, I pointed this out about where our Lord says, see my hands. Put thy finger hither and see my hands. This seeing as though it were contact with our blessed Lord. Coming to our Lord through seeing. Remember that theme we saw before? Coming to the Lord, coming to contact with the Lord through seeing. You know, he says, bring your finger hither and see my hands. He, our Lord is kind of making this equation between seeing and actually making physical contact. So in the beatific vision, that's what we see. We have the, the, the very divine essence is impressed upon our possible intellect. And that's what the beatific vision is. We receive that divine nature impressed upon our possible intellect. And it's, it's this vision that becomes just like a vision becomes a part of you. Something you see becomes in you. It stays in you. It's, it's memory is there and that, that image is there in you. That's why it's very important to be careful what we see, what we take in with our eyes. And so the beatific vision is that which we take in through our highest sense, sight, um, but it's the very nature of God. But our, our Lord equates it with, um, you know, sight and touch, which is the lowest sense. You know, he says, bring, you know, bring your, your hand here, put your finger here, and see the prints of the nails. That's interesting as well because um, there is a, I think it's, it's either the Seventh-day Adventist or the Jehovah's Witnesses, if, if it's not the one or the other, uh, then pardon me, it is one of those two, but I can't remember. But, um, but this, um, this kind of goes against something that they hold. So they hold that our Lord was crucified with one nail, with his hands over. Sometimes you'll see this depiction where he's crucified on a sort of like a, like a stake, or a, you know, like a, like almost like a pole, like a thick pole, instead of a cross beam. The problem is that uh, the leader of that uh, sect had basically said that, well, you know, there is this word stipes, right? It can mean stake, but he takes it to mean, you know, to, a, to the exclusion of a cross beam. You know, it's, it's just sort of, a, sort of an incomplete understanding of the Greek, and so he takes that and just runs with it and says, oh, it's a, he was crucified on a stake. And it makes it seem like you have special knowledge, like, well, we know he was actually crucified. So they have this idea of a stake, and they, they cross his hands, and they have one nail. But yet, our Lord says nails in the plural here. So it, is, it does conform to what the Catholic tradition was in verse 25, you know, Except I see his hands and in his hands the print of the nails. Put my finger into the print of the nails in his hands, right? Um, and then I will not believe, right? But then uh, we also see in verse 28, uh, St. Thomas uh, responds when um, he sees our Lord. He responds, Ho curios mu kai ho theos mu, which is my Lord and my God. And it is in the evocative, as it were. It's, he's addressing Christ. You are my Lord and my God. He's not making an exclamation like, my God. It's not like he's doing a blasphemous exclamation. Because some will say that he's not trying to attribute divinity to our blessed Lord. Um, you know, again, Jehovah's Witnesses will say that. Um, and I'm not trying to pick on them. I'm just saying this is an, an erroneous belief that they have. But here, in the Greek, it is addressing our Lord. Curios mu kai theos mu. O my Lord and my God. He is saying to this, in, it's in the addressing tone of, you know, evocative of addressing him as, you are my Lord and my God. And uh, so our Lord uh, says, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and have believed. And so then he does, the, the, he concludes with uh, this uh, passage here in verse 30. Many other signs Jesus also did in the sight of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So let's we'll take a note of that, but then we'll move on. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that believing you may have life in his name. Now, some will take... Um, take this to be uh, a support for the idea of sola scriptura, the Bible alone, right? Many other signs Jesus did, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may have life in his name. 
believing you may have life in his name. So they're saying, well, all you need then is what is written here in this book, that you may have life in his name. But there's a problem with that. There's a problem with that interpretation. Which book is John talking about when he says these things that are written in this book? This book that he's referring to is his gospel. He's not talking about the collection of books that we now call the book, the Bible. He's talking about his gospel, his book. So if you're trying to use this verse to support sola scriptura, it's really then stating too much because what you would be saying is all you need is this book to which St. John was referring, which is the Gospel of John. In other words, you don't need anything else except for this book, which is the Gospel of John. That's all you need to be saved. And I don't think any Christian would you know, agree to that. No, but so we just we have to be clear as to what, uh, to what uh, St. John is referring when he says this book. Okay? So it's uh, it, these things are written in this book. That means St. John's Gospel, not the whole Bible. That does not equal this book what he's, to which he's referring. Okay? All right. So that concludes uh, chapter 20. Uh, so let's move on now to uh, chapter 21. Okay. So in chapter 21, let's take a look. We have here, okay. In chapter 21, we're going to see a couple of themes. Not too many jump out here, but there is that theme of truth and testimony that will show up right at the very end of the gospel, right at the very end of that chapter, chapter 21. And then finally, the theme of glory. So, in the theme of glory, we'll see this, that he's going to glorify God, St. Peter is going to glorify God by a certain kind of death. So that's how glory shows up in the Bible, in this gospel. Okay, so we're at a new location now because we're in a new chapter. So we are here at the Sea of Galilee. We're at the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And the church behind me is the Church of the Primacy of St. Peter. This Church of the Primacy of St. Peter is the location at which our Lord fed the apostles. Remember when they were fishing all night? Couldn't catch anything, as we're going to read here in John 21. And then he had prepared a little meal of fish and bread. Loaves and fish. Sound a little familiar? Loaves and fish. And the location is right there. So um, the church behind me, as I mentioned, is the place where, uh, where this took place. Let's get an aerial view of that location. Okay, so here is the church of the primacy of St. Peter. So this is the place where our Lord fed the apostles. They're fishing off, you know, somewhere over here on the sea. You can see the water of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, over here, by the way, is the mountain where our Lord uh, taught the uh, taught the people for the three days and they gave the bread of life discourse. But down here, again, look how close. It's not very far away at all. Down here is the church of the multiplication of the loaves. Look how close that is to the other location where our Lord fed them with loaves and fishes a second time. So he fed them here with bread and fish. And you remember what he said to the apostles when he fed the people. You give them something to eat. Remember that? He said to them way back in John chapter 6, you give them something to eat. And then here our Lord feeds them with bread and fish, but he also has them provide. Go and take of the fish that you've caught and, um, and add to the, to the meal, as it were. Uh, let's take a little... Zoom in on the church there. Okay, so there is the church of the multiplication. I'm sorry, the church of the, they call it Mensa Christi, the church of the primacy of St. Peter. The reason why it's called the church of the primacy of St. Peter is because this is where our Lord confirmed St. Peter, as we're going to see in his mission of confirming the brethren, of tending the sheep, feeding the sheep, feeding the lambs. And so, uh, it's up here on these rocks inside this church. There, there's more rocks just like this inside the church, and it's up there where the fire was, where he 
uh, was had the little cooked a little breakfast for them um, up there. Okay. So now looking the other way, if you were to look out over the sea, this is the view you have. As you can see, the mountains are beautiful over here. There's the mountains in the distance here. You're looking across the Sea of Galilee. It's really kind of a beautiful, uh, beautiful shore, beautiful shoreline. Okay. So we recall what happened. Uh, our Lord showed himself to the apostles on the Sea of Tiberias. That's the same sea, by the way, Sea of Tiberias, um, Sea of Galilee, okay? And there were with him uh, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, uh, sons of Zebedee. So there's seven of them, okay? Um, so not all the apostles are there. There's seven of them there. And so Simon Peter goes fishing. Uh, Jesus stood on the shore. Now, it's interesting uh, because the place where he was fishing was actually where, where the water comes in. There, it's actually the fishing should have been very good there, uh, but here he's failing. <laughs> so Peter, even in his old pastime as a fisherman, he's just he's just not quite doing it. And so uh, our Lord, I think, is trying to show him they fish all night, and he doesn't catch a thing. So our Lord is basically trying to tell him not to uh, rely on his own his own forces, his own strengths, as it were. And uh, this is also fulfilling something that you see in Ezekiel chapter 47, uh, verse 10. Remember in Ezekiel chapter 47, there's that vision that Ezekiel has of the temple. And it's not the temple in Jerusalem. It's a little bit different dimension. So this is some sort of mystical temple that Ezekiel is seeing in Ezekiel 47. And he sees water flowing out from the side of the temple, from the right side of the temple. So that should uh, attract our attention because, of course, um, this uh, was fulfilled when our Lord had the blood and water flowing out from the right side of the temple of his body on the cross. We see that in Ezekiel 47, uh, verse 2, that the waters came out and they ran out on the right side of the temple. And the further they went out, the deeper they got, the further they went all the way to the sea. And it says, all those to whom the waters came were healed. All those to whom the waters came uh, were healed. Uh, so this is also important for our time of year right now. We're in Easter tide when this is being recorded. And so this, uh, this is the time where we have the Vidi Aquam. I saw water flowing from the right side of the temple. And all those to whom the waters came were healed. Right. So this is the foreshadowing the waters of baptism. All those to whom those waters of baptism come will be healed healed of original sin and any sin that may be on the soul at the time the person receives baptism. And so these waters uh, go out to the sea. The sea is a symbol of the Gentiles. And so this water going out to the sea and healing them is saying that Christ will go and heal the Gentiles. And let's, uh, let's take a look at verse 9. This is Ezekiel, by the way, Ezekiel 47, verse 9. Every living creature that creepeth whithersoever the torrent of water shall come shall live. And it says, uh, all things shall live to which the torrent of water shall come. They shall be healed. And it says, here's the key line here, and there shall be fishes in abundance after these waters shall come there. And they shall be healed and all things shall live to which the torrent shall come. And verse 10, and the fishers shall stand over the waters. The fishermen shall stand over these waters and they will catch it says, from Engedi even to Engalim, there shall be the, the, great, the drying of the nets. There shall be many sorts of the fishes thereof, as the fishes of the great sea, a very great multitude. Remember, there's a very great multitude of fish that he caught in this miraculous catch of fish. And it says also in verse 12, that these waters shall issue forth from the sanctuary. So this is definitely a liturgical thing that's happening here. The, the water's coming out from the sanctuary. This is, uh, a, uh, this is in fact, a, uh, um, a spiritual thing that's happening, but also a liturgical thing, which means a priestly thing. That's why we do baptisms in churches. We don't go out to the rivers or the seas and just do them out there. It says the waters shall issue forth out of the sanctuary. So it's in a holy place where baptism is ta has, takes place. So... 
At any rate, let's get back to John 21. And so in John 21, um, our Lord cries out to them from the shore. Uh, he says, uh, Little children, have you, do you have any meat? And they answered, no. Or any meat. He doesn't mean like meat as in flesh, you know, or it's food. Did you, did you, have you caught anything? And they answered, no. And he says, cast the net on the right side of the ship. Hmm, right side, but now of the ship. So now this is, it's like the, the, the ship is being, uh, is a symbol of the, the, the body of Christ. Well, the church is the body of Christ, as we see in 1 Corinthians 12. But now he's saying, cast it to the right side. Remember we saw the waters flowing from the right side of the temple. So now it's as though the ship is the body of Christ symbolically. And they cast them to the right side, and that's where they will find the life. Remember, where the waters come, there shall have life. That's where they find the fish on the right side. Cast your nets on the right side. And they cast, therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the great multitude of fish, just as we saw in Ezekiel 47, verse 10, a great multitude of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved, St. John, he's being humble, he doesn't mention his name, it is the Lord. Simon Peter, when he heard that it was the Lord, girt his, lo his coat about him, and he cast himself into the sea. Now, I want to make a note there where it says, for he was naked. He wasn't like completely naked. So when the, the term he was naked means uh, for, the, for them, it just means he did not have his tunic on, right? So sometimes people think, oh, or they think that our Lord was crucified naked or something. No, they, they had a loincloth about them, you know. Let your loins be girt, our Lord says, you know. So that's how they would labor, with their loins girt. They would have this loincloth, but he would have his outer tunic off, you know. So, okay, so he was shirtless, but he still had something. He wasn't completely... You know, it's just, people have this image and, you know, they, they get too much into this the theology of the body or something like that. And they're just, you know, it's not the case. He was not completely, you know, nude while he's fishing there. Um, okay, but then he cast, him, uh, cast himself into the sea. Uh, there's other passages where we can kind of point out this, what uh, St. Paul, you know, St. Paul says, I would not have you naked, but have you clothed upon, right? So there's this image of, of grace being something we're clothed with. Um, in fact, uh, St. Joan of Arc, during her trial, um, she saw Saint, She had seen St. Michael. She had seen an image of St. Michael, a vision of St. Michael, and they asked her, part of her trial, they, they have the whole thing written down, what, you know, her, the questions and the responses, and they asked her, you know, did you see St. Michael? And she said, yes. And they asked her, was he naked? And she responded, she said, do you think that God does not have the wherewithal to clothe St. Michael? <laughs> it's a pretty good response, you know. Like, do you think God wouldn't, would have the, the sense not to uh, clothe St. Michael? Anyway, so uh, anyway, let's get back to this. So he, uh, he jumps into the water, swims to the shore for the, in his eagerness to come to our blessed Lord. And so then he drew the net to land, 153 fish. Okay. Um, now, what is that number? Some people will attribute things to the number. Um, it's not clear exactly what that is. Now, um, in Israel, um, so in the second book of Chronicles, or Paralipomenon, depending on how your Bible names the books, Chronicles, or Paralipomenon is how the Septuagint names it. Paralipomenon simply means things left out or things put in the Chronicles. So the Chronicles are the things that are left out of the book of Kings. That's why there's a lot of duplication in the book of Chronicles. Um, there's things that were left out of the book of Kings and they were put into the book of Chronicles and sometimes there are parallel stories that are going on in the book of Chronicles. But that's why it's called Paralipomenon. It's things left out at any rate. It's the second Chronicles uh, or Paralipomenon chapter 2 verse 17 and it says that the proselytes, right, so those that they had evangelized in Israel, so when they came in to the promised land and they converted people as so the proselytes that uh, that were in Israel uh, when they had uh, come into the promised land numbered 153,000. So there's that 153 number. It was the number of proselytes, people converted to, that means someone converted to, converted to the Jewish faith, which at that time was the real faith, the valid faith in the Old Testament. The proselytes, those converted to them, were 153,000. And then here, Peter, St. Peter, and the other apostles draw up 153 fish. 
So this could be a connection between those. Um, it's also kind of nice that uh, in a full rosary, uh, that is the joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries, along with the three at the beginning, you have 153 Hail Marys. That's kind of nice too. But at any rate, um, yeah, take that as you, as you will. And uh, so then he draws up the fish, and then our Lord gave them, and here it is in verse 13, bread and fish. So now he's got the loaves and the fishes. Again, just yards, yards from the place where he gave them bread and fish. And again, he has now the apostles involved in working the miracle to catch these fish, just like at the feeding of the, of the 5,000, and not too far away, which happened not too far away, he has the apostles, you give them something to eat. Our Lord blessed the bread and the fish, and he gave it to the apostles and put it in their hands, and it was in their hands that it was multiplied. It was, they were the ones distributing it. And so you can see there is that our Lord, I think, is drawing a connection between that miracle, bread and fish, and the one that took place just yards away, and this one here that takes place where the apostles again provide fish in a miraculous manner through, through of course, the working of our Lord, but he's, they are providing this, this fish in a miraculous manner uh, once again. And this chapter is completely about the, the mission of the apostles. It's, it's, you know, sending them forth and, you know, reconfirming St. Peter in his role as chief of the apostles. Um, so it's, it's almost a reconfirming of what took place in John chapter 6. Uh, you know, you give them something to eat. Okay, so then we get to verse 15. Now, this is a very interesting interchange that you have between our Lord and St. Peter. It says that when they had eaten, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me more than these? Okay. So, um, and uh, this is a, it's an interesting um, interplay that we're going to see here. Um, we're getting close to the end of the chapter. Um, we, we are taking uh, questions on our Facebook page tonight. So, um, uh, if you want to go there, I'm not a huge Facebook fan, but at any rate, it's a, it's a venue. And uh, so you can, uh, you can put, put those questions on our Facebook page. And that's where we'll take them for questions in, in just a few minutes. But let's, I, I want to delve into the, what our Lord says to Simon Peter here, because his interchange with them, if you don't understand what's going on, you, we're going to miss a lot, okay? So let's take a look. Uh, and you're familiar with this passage. Let's take a look at what he says. So first, our Lord asks this question. Lovest thou me more than these? So the first question that he's asking St. Peter is a question of how much he loves him in comparison to the others. Okay, that's important. The first time, it's in comparison to the others. Now, let's look at St. Peter's response. Okay, lovest thou me more than these? St. Peter responds, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Okay, and then he responds, our Lord responds, Feed my lambs. Now, uh, your Bible might have it a little bit differently, but this is as it's translated directly from the Greek. Okay, because uh, the, the word for uh, lambs there is uh, arnia mu, which is uh, my lambs, arnia mu. Arnia is different than um, uh, probata, which is uh, the, the sheep, the adult ones, right? The arnias are the, the young ones, huh? So, okay, feed my lambs, is, and then the Greek arnia mu, okay. Then he asks the second time, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? Now notice, there's, there's not the comparison this time. Not, do you love me more than these others, these other apostles? Here it's simply, do you love me? Not in comparison to the others. And St. Peter responds with the same thing, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And then our Lord responds back to him, Tend my sheep. Okay, tend my sheep. What he says is, uh, uh, Poi my ne. Ta probata mu. Okay, so uh, tend my sheep. It's not. It's a little bit different than bef before. He said bosque, which is feed. Bosque arnia mu. Feed my lambs. This time he said he says poi my ne. Ta probata mu. So uh, tend my 
probata, which is now sheep. Okay, it's different from lambs. Okay, not a huge distinction, but it is a distinction. Next, our Lord says, Lovest thou me? It seems like the same question, but we're going to see that there is a distinction our Lord makes. And St. Peter responds, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. And then our Lord responds to him, Bosque ta probatamu, which is feed my sheep. So the first time he says, feed my lambs, then tend my sheep, then feed my sheep. So there is a distinction between tending and feeding, between bosque, feeding, bosque, <clears throat> and poi uh, mane. And then there's also a distinction between arnia and probata. So these are the sheep are adult lambs, right? Feeding, of course, giving food to, but tending is, you're, you're tending them, you're, you're governing them, okay? So that is part of the role of the church and priesthood is to govern not only the young ones, but the older ones as well. And not only tending the older ones, but even feeding the older ones. Okay, but there's more going on here than what first appears, okay? So we're going to take a look at these words as they are in the Greek. We're just going to take one of the, you're not going to have to teach you a bunch of Greek right now, but uh, we're going to take uh, the word that our Lord is using for love. That's key. The word that our Lord uses for love and the word that St. Peter replies for the word love. They're different. Let's take a look. Okay. So, um, our Lord says, Haha, lovest thou me more than these? And St. Peter replies, Okay, well, the word that our Lord used, I'm not sure how that other one got there, I apologize, so just ignore that. <laughs> but he says, Lovest thou me more than these? Thou knowest that I love thee. Now, our Lord used the word agapais, or agapais, sometimes you'll see it that way, agapais which is a total sacrificial self-giving love. But Peter replies with philo say. Our Lord asked agapais me and he replied philo say. I love that's a love in a general way. You see it philo like the word philosophy, philo it's the same root philosophy, the love of wisdom. But that's kind of a general love. It's not like you have a self-sacrificial relationship with wisdom. It's not, that, that's not philosophy. It's not that kind of love. It's love in a general way. It might include friends, but it's a general way. But our Lord was asking this question. Do you love me in the total self-sacrificial way more than these others? So the, remember the first question was compared to the others. Okay. And he replied, philose. Okay. Second time our Lord asked, lovest thou me? And, our, and St. Peter replies, I love thee, philo say. Our Lord had asked, however, agapes me, which is, do you love me? So first it was, do you love me more than these in this total sacrificial self-giving way? And now here he simply asks, do you love me in the total self-sacrificial way? Peter replies, philo say. This is a lesser form of love. It's a general love, you know. Then the third time, our Lord says, Lovest thou me? Now, there is, there's a part here where uh, St. Peter, if you notice, uh, St. Peter says this. So, he, our Lord asks St. Peter, Lovest thou me? And now our Lord uses this word, Phileis. May. Do you love me in a general way? In other words, do you even love me in that general way? Well, um, you can just imagine St. Peter's response because the first time he asked, do you love me in that total self-sacrificial way compared to the others more than them? Do you love, them, do you love me more than them in this self-sacrificial way? Second time he asked, do you even love me in that self-sacrificial way. The third time, our Lord asks, do you love me in the general way? 
And that's why we have this passage where St. Peter says, well, St. Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, Philes me, do you even love me in this general way? Right? And that's why Peter was grieved. He was sad that the third time our Lord lowered his expectations, as it were. And St. Peter's response, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, but which one did he use? He kept it, the general way, philo. I love thee in the general way. So St. Peter at this moment doesn't come up to that full, total, self-sacrificial love that our Lord was calling him to. Now, uh, he will later on, of course, we know uh, St. Peter uh, you know, gave his life for our blessed Lord on the cross. But our Lord, even though uh, you know, St. Peter was being asked to love him in this total self-sacrificial way, he accepted that love that he did have, and he still confirmed him in this mission of tending his sheep, feeding his lambs, feeding his sheep. And then he says that uh, he will be, he predicts his death. You know, he says that uh, another will stretch forth thy hands. You know, he says that when thou, art, thou wast younger, another, uh, you did gird yourself. And when you be older, you shall stretch forth thy hands. Another shall gird thee and lead thee whether thou wouldst not. It's kind of interesting that in these words, which are given at the clothing of a religious sister, by the way, she receives the cincture, she receives the, uh, the scapular, um, and the habit. Um, but notice that uh, these words, you will stretch forth your hands, another will gird thee and lead thee whether thou wouldst not. In these three words of our Lord, these three things that will happen to him, you have the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Stretch forth your hands. Your hands are empty. Poverty. Another will gird you. The girding, the, the cincture around the waist, symbol of chastity, girding one's uh, loins. Chastity, poverty, chastity, and then finally obedience. Another would lead thee. You have obedience to your uh, religious superior. So poverty, chastity, and obedience. Um, so it's a fitting um, verse that is used when someone is entering into the religious life. And then uh, when St. Peter says, well, what about John? You know, this one, the one who leaned his very head on your breast at the Last Supper. He says, well, but it's, it says, uh, you see some translations that say, so I will have him remain till I come. What is it to thee? Follow thou me. But if you notice in the, um, well, in the, in the Vulgate, it says, seek eum volo manere, which means, I will him thus to remain till I come. What is it to thee? Follow thou, thou me. I will him thus. But in, in which way to remain? He was following him. So John was already following him, as we saw in the verse before, verse 20. The Peter saw the disciple following Christ. So even while he was having this private conversation with Peter, John was still following Christ. And our Lord repl replies to St. Peter's question, this is how I will have him. Thus I will have him remain till I come. What is it to thee? Follow thou me. So you follow me. And then uh, St. John concludes his gospel with uh, the words, the revelation that he is that disciple that he was talking about this whole time. This is that disciple who giveth testimony of these things. There's that testimony, truth, and hath written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written down every one, the world itself, I think, would not be able to contain the books that should be written. And that's why we have apostolic tradition, divine tradition, to pass on those truths that uh, are not written. So, we've come to the conclusion of the, of the gospel. So, uh, thank you for persevering uh, with me. We'll take some questions now, um, but I, I hope uh, you learned something in this study of St. John's Gospel. I hope it's been fruitful to you, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, you persevere in a Bible study uh, guided by the Church uh, for your faith. Okay, so let's see. 
How can we have any faith that the locations in the Holy Land are actually the locations we read about in the scriptures? That's pretty easy. Um, if you go to Dallas, Texas, and you say, hey, where was Kennedy shot? If you ask anyone, they'll say, oh, yeah, right there. Dealey Plaza, there it is. That's where he was shot. Everyone knows it. You know, all the locals know it. Well, even the non-locals know it, right? So when the Crusaders came, when the Jews came, when they said, where did they set the guard? They asked the Roman soldiers, which tomb were you guarding? That was the tomb. Well, they asked the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, guard that sealed, you know, they, had the, they actually had their own temple seal on it. Where did you seal? Which tomb did you seal? That's the one right there. And you ask the locals, where was the tomb? There it was right there. James, who was there in the upper room, and he spoke to our Lord, he was the bishop of Jerusalem for years and years and years afterwards. I think they would have gotten it right, you know. So they knew those places, right? They knew these places, and everyone, they made such a big deal out of it. And that's why we, when they've done excavations there, they see that there's altar upon altar and, and foundation of church upon foundation of church, all pointing to that location, all right? So that's why we have that, you know. Um, I know that there is a, there's another place that they, that, um, it, from the 1800s, some people began claiming, oh, it's the garden tomb. This, there's this other location. Why? Well, because someone thought, well, that's, they, they came into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and they thought, wow, this is really gaudy. Look how many candles they have and all these icons and it's, it's gold and it's too, it's sensory overload. And like, this is, this doesn't seem, seems to cheapen the place or something. But see, that's how people's devotion is, right? They just start, you know, they, they, they start stripping the, the place of, you know, like you go to Dealey Plaza or something, people are taking earth from the place, you know, and um, they, they, that's how they would, uh, they wouldn't waste their time, you know, to, to build those edifices unless that were actually the place where it was. Um, so it just seems so, un, um, so unlikely that it's, it's not going to be any other uh, place. So, okay. Um, what is the significance of St. Thomas's proclamation, my Lord and my God, and why do we say this during the elevation? Well, it is a, a statement, a clear statement of uh, the divinity of our Lord. He is addressing our Lord Jesus, and he is saying, you are my Lord and my God. And there are people that contest that, they, they will contest that uh, our Lord claimed divinity in the sacred scriptures, but it's clear or, or they'll contest that the apostles believed, even believed that our Lord was, was divine. But it's clear here that St. Thomas believed he was divine. So that's why it shows that importance. And so when he saw the Lord, and he realized he was in the presence of the Lord, he said, my Lord and my God. And so also, when the apostles, those two, rather those two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus, when their eyes were opened and they saw the Lord, right, Notice when it was that they saw the Lord. It wasn't after the Bible study. Our Lord was leading them on a Bible study, probably the best one ever, you know, on the road to Emmaus. And he says, in beginning from Moses, he pointed out to them all the places in Scripture that pointed to him. You talk about an excellent Bible study. But they still didn't recognize our Lord. But it wasn't until the breaking of the bread, and when he broke the bread, gave it to him, then their eyes were opened. That's when they saw, this is the Lord. And that's why we proclaim it also. When we see the Lord, my Lord and my God, at the elevation, uh, we're, we're saying the same thing that St. Thomas did. So I think it's a, a beautiful connection back to the early Christian church when we do that at Holy Mass. Okay, why would a priest withhold absolution? That's a really good question. Okay, why not just loose instead of binding also if God is faithful to forgive? Right. Very good question. Okay. Now, uh, why would he withhold absolution? He would only withhold absolution if there is some doubt as to the sincerity of the, of the person's conversion. You know, the, uh, Bishop Sheen talks about this time where he um, was uh, with some man who is living you know, in an illicit relationship, you know, living with a woman that he should not be, living in sin, you know, with the woman. And Bishop Sheen was talking to him and he was trying to, um, you know, to convince him, trying to get him to repent from his um, illicit relationship. And he said, well, let's, let's meet, you know. And, and the guy meets and he brings the girl along and, he, and Bishop Sheen says, this is not a social engagement. He's like, we, we've got to address this issue of your sin. And the guy wouldn't leave the girl. He wanted absolution. 
He wanted to be forgiven from his sins. He wanted to be able to go to communion, but he didn't want to leave the girl that he was having an illicit relationship with. And Bishop Sheen couldn't absolve him. You know, that's really the, the case is when someone will not leave a near occasion of sin. And that's what we promise to do at the uh, act of contrition, right? I firmly resolve with the help of thy grace to confess my sins, to do penance, and to amend my life. Or you might know it as, and to avoid the near occasions of sin. If the person is living in an occasion of sin, he's not avoiding it. And that statement would be a lie. That act of contrition would be a lie. Even though he might want absolution, which basically ends up for him being permission to go to communion, but he wants permission to go to communion while he's still in sin. That's when the priest cannot absolve. The person is in an occasion of sin and he won't give it up. Okay. And sometimes we're not our own best judgment, you know, best, best judges in those cases, you know, where, uh, where the, um, you know, perhaps, uh, uh, the, the, perhaps the priest keeps giving the same medicine. He gives the medicine, he gives a prescription for the person, and the person won't take it. At a certain point he says, okay, I got to stop writing prescriptions, because are you serious about taking the medicine? I'm giving you the solution to get out of your sin, and you're not taking it. You know, it's like, you know, just imagine sin, it's, it's like killing ourselves, you know, you commit sin, a mortal sin, it's like, it's like the death, of, well, it's worse than, than one's killing oneself, um, which already is already horrible, but um, if a person by some miracle is brought back to life, and then he gets that same gun again, and he kills himself, and then by another miracle, he's brought back to life, and then he gets that same gun again, and he kills himself. At a certain point, we have to say, you can't have that gun. <laughs> You have to stay, you can't handle the firearm. You have to keep that away from you. And if the person says, I'm not going to give up the gun, and that priest might say, you're not really sorry. Do you see what I mean? If the person is, has a voluntary occasion of sin, not one that's unavoidable. Sometimes there are occasions of sins that are not avoidable. We're trying our best and we can't. That's a different thing. Okay. But we're talking about a voluntary occasion of sin person will not give up and it's voluntary. He just wants to keep that whatever it is that he won't let go of. Um, that's when the priest would have to delay absolution until that person has gotten rid of. Because the priest also has to wake him up to his state. If he realizes, look, you can't go to heaven in this way. Yeah, and the priest might have to wake him up with that delay of absolution. You know, it's never something a priest ever wants to do. But um, Okay. So, let's see, another, uh, another question. Why wasn't St. Thomas with the other disciples when the Lord revealed himself? It's not clear why he was, it's not clear to me. There may be some tradition as to what he was doing. I don't know what it was, though. Um, so, is there a significance to St. Thomas' unbelief lasting eight days? Yes, good point. It does say that it was on the eighth day, and after eight, eight days. So, the eighth day points to the resurrection. Remember the first day of the week we talked about? So, the seventh day is the Sabbath. That would be Saturday, right? So the day of rest, that's the seventh day. But then the first day of the week, then that's, if you're, you know, what was the previous day? Seven, so then this would be like an eighth day. So the day of the resurrection was the eighth day. It's like the, it's like the eternal age. That's why often in tradition, baptismal fonts were octagonal in shape because they express this, this eighth day, this eternal day of eternity. You know, we have seven days in our time in this, this earth. You know, we have a seven-day week. But the eighth day is the eternal day that does not end. So that is where he sees God uh, in this eighth day. So it's pointing towards us being able to see God each, in eternity on the eighth day of our, uh, uh, of our eternity. Okay. All right. Um, was St. Peter aware that he was answering Jesus in a lower form of love? He was aware. And that's why when our Lord responded that third time, when, the, when our Lord asked the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me even in that general way? That's why Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time. He, he asked me if I even love him just like in general. That's why he was grieved. So he did understand. He was using this, this language. St. Peter was using this language. But St. Peter was also at this point he had been humbled. He had been humbled by his triple fall, and now our Lord wanting a triple affirmation of his love. St. Peter, nonetheless, was not willing to overstate what he had been overstating pre prior. 
Remember previous, a few days previous to that, he had been saying, even if all these others abandon you, I will not abandon you. And so our Lord says, do you love me compared to all these others in that total self-sacrificial way? And Peter, in his humility at this point, humility, says, I love you in the general way, Lord. I, I, he's not ready to commit because he's not uh, sure of himself. So he actually has learned some humility here, and that's, that was really the reason why our Lord permitted that, that fall. Okay. Um, okay, why does the end of chapter 20 sound like the end of the gospel according to St. John? Was chapter 1 added later? Uh, it was not added later. Um, there, uh, there are, uh, you might say it's, it's kind of like an, like an epilogue, but it, it was written by St. John. We don't have, I don't think there's any serious people that contest uh, the, the, the final um, uh, uh, chapter of uh, St. John's Gospel. Um, but, um, you know, uh, it's, it's not clear. It, it, it does speak about the, the written in this book. But he also brings it together nicely um, uh, with the idea of re returning to the testimony and returning to the, uh, the following of, uh, of Christ and this triple affirmation. Uh, you know, this triple affirmation, we, that was left incomplete then with the, uh, the triple denial of our Lord. It's left incomplete with this, unless you have this triple affirmation of his love. So um, uh, I have not heard any... Um, uh, knowledgeable scholar uh, say that this was added later. Um, I have heard people uh, state that about Mark, which gets a, a bit confusing because then if you say that the part that they some will say was added later uh, because it's missing from another number of manuscripts, okay, and this is what's not missing from St. John's Gospel, chapter 21 is not missing from manuscripts, but uh, in Mark's Gospel, there are some verses missing from some manuscripts, as the last page of a book might be sometimes missing. And, uh, however, if you believe that those verses that are contested in St. Mark's Gospel were added later, then you would have to conclude that St. Mark ended his Gospel with the words, and they were afraid. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't conclude my Gospel with the words, and they were afraid. That's not how you want to conclude the good news. <laughs> so, okay. So, well, we are at the end of our time, and um, uh, there is one last question that I do want to address. It's about the, uh, the love of Peter in the self-sacrificial way. You know, is that, well, if Peter was not able to love God in that self-sacrificial way, what kind of hope is there for the rest of us? There's quite a lot of hope. Because of this, he was called to that higher form of love, which eventually he did get to. And that's where the hope comes in, huh? But Peter, in his weakness, wasn't ready to commit to that. And that's why, look at what a great saint he was, and yet look how weak he was. We see how weak Peter was. Even after he had walked on water, even after he had seen the miracles of our Lord, he still fell. So if he can be forgiven, you can too, if you're repentant of your sin. Okay, so don't think there's no hope. But Peter wasn't left in that state. Our Lord lifted him up out of that state. So there is also hope for us too. That's most important. We have to realize that yes, God loves us where we are at, but he loves us way too much to leave us right there where we're at. He wants to lift us up. He wants us to love him with the love of God. That my joy may be in you, he says, and your joy may be full. You know, St. Thomas says that, you know, charity is where God shares his joy with us. That's what we want to have is this full love of God. We want to achieve that, that higher love. That's what God's calling us to. Don't be downcast if you're not there. God loves you still. But keep coming up higher, as our Lord invites us to do. Okay, let's conclude. We'll conclude with a prayer, and I'll give you a blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint John the Apostle, pray for us. And I'll give you all a blessing.
Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, descendat super vos et maniat semper. Amen. God bless you.